A few of you were up in Hamilton, some of this will look familiar, but I've added a few things, changed a few things. Plus repetition's good, right? Okay. New clicker, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, I'm used to being in medical centers, so I have to make sure I disclose that I have nothing to disclose. I don't have any pharmaceutical representatives that I'm having attendance in, in disguise. Fort Worth is a, uh, a city of about a million. The Dallas-Fort Worth area has about four million, so about the same as New Zealand. Drive in it every day. Absolutely gorgeous city. That's our courthouse, and my wife's law firm is right across the street from that courthouse. Some of you, if you ever watch the old show Texas, Walker, Texas Ranger, that is the courthouse where they filmed. So, a nah, little trivia there. And we have our own Longhorn cattle herd. And we have on, on staff for the city paid employees who are cowboys and cowgirls. They drive them out of the stockyards up Main Street in the, in the stockyards area every morning and every afternoon. So when you come, that's the thing you want to see. But you don't want to be standing taking that picture too long. <laughs> they are really big animals. And this is how Texas views the world. <laughs> it really does. It is just, uh, we are big in Texas and we have a fairly inflated sense of self. This is a horned frog, the Texas Christian University mascot. So make a peace sign. Make it angry. <laughs> Go frogs. It's actually the state lizard of Texas. It's the horned lizard. It eats ants. It's a, it's a wonderful, uh, ecologically friendly animal. And uh, it defends itself with the spikes, as you can see, but also it squirts blood out of its eyes at its enemies, up, up to six feet. And it's, it can get about as big as my palm, but it's not dangerous at all. And we are known for football. We won the Rose Bowl a few years ago, ranked number two in the nation. We're usually in the top 25. So uh, this is a stadium on a Saturday with about 50,000 people in it, packed out, national television. So we are known for that, but I wish we were better known for our academics because that's really what we stand out for. We're among the top 25 best universities to work at in the nation and are ranked in the top 100 universities in the United States by U.S. News & World Report, and we're getting better and better. That's our goal is to increase our academics. Absolutely gorgeous campus. We have a lot of money, a lot of money. <laughs> A lot of, very few alumni with a lot of money. So, do you like my haircut? Yeah, I, I think my stylists like my haircut. It's not the haircut I asked for. This is the shortest my hair's been in five years. I go in and say, this is three weeks growth, just trim it, don't style it, sheared me. That's a bit of what I'm going to be talking about today. Shouldn't you get the haircut you want? Am I talking to people who agree with the stylist? Shouldn't you get the haircut you want? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's this wonderful metaphor that the boys at Brief in London use, and that is therapy should be like getting into a cab. The driver says, where to, Gov? Great. We don't know where they're going. The client should tell us where they'd like to go. So my mother died about four years ago uh, next month. And uh, although I was there, I'm going to give you a bit of a metaphor. I was there when she died. I'll give you a bit of a metaphor if uh, I'd flown in for her funeral. So the first scenario is I get out of the airport and I jump in the cab and he says, where to? And I say, go to Grace Lutheran at 16th and, uh, and Edwards. Okay. He cranks up the radio and he's chatting and asking questions and he rolls the windows up and turns on the air conditioning and he gets the fastest route up there, least scenic, and drops me off and I'm ready for the funeral, right? I'm ready for the funeral. Second scenario, I get out, off the airplane, I can see myself doing this, a great visualization for those of you who are future oriented, some solution focused people in here. See myself walking out the door and getting into the cab and he says, where to? I say, I'd like to go to Grace Lutheran. Drop the bag in, get in the car, get in the cab. And he says, why are you here? And I'm, I'm here for my mother's funeral. I am so sorry, right? A bit of empathy. Then he says, would you like to uh, have the radio on? No, I think I'd like to ride in silence. Would you like the windows up or down? I'm going to roll the windows down. It's spring. I don't get to smell spring much. We don't have spring in Texas. We have summer and we have Christmas. Those are our two seasons. <laughs> two seasons. Smelling the spring air, scents that are really familiar growing up in the city. We get to 10th and, and uh, Cliff, and I said, could you turn right and go down to 12th and go up 12th? It's where I used to ride my bike down to the swimming pool. It's where I rode to the baseball stadium. All the kinds of things I used to do as a kid. 
And we get up there and they say, well, we're at 12th and Cleveland. And I say, could you go straight and go up to Stefan? I want to drive by the old house. So we drive up by the old house, stop for just a minute, just a minute or so. Reminiscing, seeing my mother's Norwegian flag and just below the American flag on her flagpole. Very, very proud of the Norwegian flag I have hanging in my office now. And I get to the funeral and I get out. Now, which ride was better for me? Yeah. It didn't take any longer. It wasn't any more arduous for the person who was driving. All it was was consulting with the passenger as to what you'd like this to be like. So let's talk about solution-focused brief therapy. Some of you think you know what it is. Some of you are quite certain you know what it is, which frightens me a bit. In 1997, Steve DeShazer and Insu Kim Berg wrote an article saying this is what solution-focused brief therapy is. The best that we can print it out. And it's what I would call digital. It's things that you can see or hear. Miracle question, scaling question, a break, and then after the intermission, which I love the, that they use that term, you come back with some type of a task often called an experiment. And the European Brief Therapy Association used this as the defining what solution-focused brief therapy is for the last about 20 years. And some of you would say, yeah, that's solution-focused brief therapy. <coughs> because that's what you learned it in 1997. And you didn't really learn much since then, which is fine, because this is solution-focused brief therapy. And so is this. Steve DeShazer, Insu Kimberg, and other well, very well-known people in the field came up with a different list in Steve's last book, with these people more than miracles. If it works, do more of it. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. If it's not working, do something different. Those are from the Mental Research Institute. Those weren't even original with solution-focused brief therapy. Those have been around since the 50s. Small steps can lead to big changes. Solution is not necessarily the problem. The language for a solution is different than the language for a problem. And no problems happen all the time. There are exceptions. Now, these are things you can't see. What are these? These are assumptions. So 10 years later, this is what solution-focused brief therapy is. And some of you learned solution-focused brief therapy with these in mind, based on assumptions. You're also doing solution-focused brief therapy. And then Michael Durant wrote an article in the, solution, the Journal of Solution-Focused Brief Therapy just about a year and a half ago, saying, I have looked at everything that I can look at of what's the cutting edge of solution-focused brief therapy, and this is how I would define it. If you don't have this, you're not doing solution-focused brief therapy. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Let's put it that way. You, you, if you're not doing this, you're not doing it. Just because you're doing this doesn't mean it's solution-focused. But these are necessary pieces. You're talking about how it will make a difference. It's future-focused. You explore what the client has already been able to achieve, which could be instances or exceptions, either way. And then the last one is the therapist does not assume what the client needs. Those aren't our assumptions, and those aren't practices. But we would know it if we saw it. We watch a session and say, those first three I could see. The last one I couldn't necessarily see. And this is somewhat the newest version of solution-focused brief therapy. So, I still go with what Steve and Gail Miller wrote. Did they skip that slide? Oh, shoot. You saw my guru slide. Was that the earlier hairstyle? <laughs> yeah. So here's my first question for you. Point at your partner. You might have to turn around, point at somebody, partner up, twos. Point, make sure you're pointing at the same person. Yeah, twos, threes at the max. Max at three. Max at three, you can do two there, and there's two and two. Try to get twos. We can do this quickly. Twos. Twos. Point at your partner. Okay. Okay. So what I would like you to do is, some of your students, and you, do, you have not done solution-focused brief therapy, so I, I put this in a, in a form I hope that anybody could respond to. How would you or how are you? How would you know that you're doing good solution-focused therapy? And what do you base that on? Now your partner might need to think for a second before he or she speaks. 
Some of you, some of you think I can tell because your lips are moving, because you think as you talk, but others might need a moment. So if you need a moment, just ask your partner to wait. I'll give you three minutes, about a minute apiece, a minute and a half. How do you know? Everyone back? I know I'm interrupting someone. It's always the professors who have to finish their sentence because they're not very compliant. So you're waiting on the professors. Very good, very good, very good. So you've already got a theme for today. You know that I'm more interested in the client's viewpoint than yours. So I won't ask you to share yours. I really am. And I've been at this a long time because I gave up the idea of being a guru a long time ago. When I went into a more postmodern social constructionist frame of mind, I began to see that what's really important is to have temporary certainty, or what uh, Walter Anderson calls having both feet firmly planted in midair. So I could be right today or completely wrong. But in the end, I really need to go forth with what I know, how I know it at the moment. And what I discovered back a long time ago was that most of us have very inflated views of how good we are. I don't have to tell you this, because if I took a poll in here, most of you would put yourself in the top 50% of therapists. Well, on the bell curve, somebody's got to fall below average. In the work that's been done by Walfish and others, and this is the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, they had some major research, 272 people in their sample, 25% put themselves in the top 90th percentile. And only one person said they're below average. We're just not very good at having clean judgments of how good we are because we use our own standards. Hi. We use our own standards. Now, we've known this for a long time in many fields. The Dunning-Kruger effect is that the less experienced someone is, the higher they believe their competency is. Until they get that, oh, shoot. And I would, I would have used another term if I'd have been in Texas. And we begin to, as we get more experience, we see how little we know. We begin to know what we don't know or see what we haven't seen. We begin to see that we're ignorant about a lot of things. And as we get better, it gets better. We begin to grow our confidence again. The remarkable thing about this graph is it's exactly the same graph as marriage satisfaction. <laughs> if people are first married, that's as happy as they'll ever be. About five or seven years in, most of them having their first child, lowest it'll ever be. <laughs> Near the end of their life, End of, the, end of the relationship if they stayed together. It gets higher, but never gets back to the beginning. So, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy that honeymoon. <laughs> now, you have to know that it, this is a research symposium. I'm going to be talking about practice-based research, which is really practical stuff, but I'm not talking about you. So if I throw a rock in the middle of a pack of dogs, one of Yelps has got one that got hit, right? That's an old Texas thing. If it fits for you, great, but I'm talking about generally expertise. You may have a very, very accurate view of how you see yourself if you're a modernist or a post-positivist, or you may have a lot of agreement as how good you are if you're more postmodern. But either way, this is the tendencies for people to say, I'm really good. I had a guy that actually said to me, one of my students, I'm, better, I'm a better therapist than 90% of the people in this county. I said, you haven't met 90% of the therapists in this county. How could you possibly say that? And from then on, this started to fall a little bit. I had the saying that I use metaphor to tell people things if I can, to kind of tell story, and then sometimes I use semaphore, which is the signaling, real clear, and then a two by four. <laughs> Big piece of wood over the head. We are also very poor judges on client outcome interioration. This was an exceptional test on looking at treatment failure with over 600 clients. And this is the graph, I think, that uh, tells us clearly what took place in this study, which is not unusual in the studies that I've seen for therapists trying to get a sense of how well people are doing or whether or not they're deteriorating. The lighter bar, I'm colorblind, so I say the lighter and darker. The lighter bar is the therapist predicted outcome was positive for 500 of the clients. The clients, this is just a little over 200, said there was a positive outcome or a noticeably positive outcome. No change. Oh, no, the therapist said everybody changed. More people had a, a no change than had a positive change when they talked to the clients. And for deterioration, there were 40 clients who identified themselves as having deteriorated. Only one was identified by the therapist. 
we've almost always exaggerated positive outcome as therapists when we don't have other data. We don't have a good sense of what's going on when it's a partnership if we only have one side of the story. So I'll go with Miller, Duncan, and Hubble. The client is actually the single most potent contributor to the outcome of therapy, and that's my theme for today. How do we access people's experiences of what they're doing and having in their lives as a part of being with us in psychotherapy? We get in, we get help, we get out. That's therapy, right? That's how most people view therapy when they come. They're not going to come in there for a lifestyle. They don't need a friend. They come in and they want something to change. They want to see something happen quickly. In fact, the curve, let's do the curve correctly, the curve is generally, if the, if, the, if the change doesn't happen in the first five to 15 sessions, there's very little change from 20 on. So the longer you stay in doesn't mean the better you're going to get. The change has to happen fairly quickly across models. So how did I get involved with trying to find client experiences of therapy? Way back in the 80s, Tracy Todd, who is now the CEO of the AAMFT, the organization that I'm writing a, a history of, was my intern. He's doing his doctoral dissertation. And we would have clients in the evening. In the last five minutes, we would swap clients. And we'd come in and say, this is research, not therapy. Tell me how Tracy did. Tell me how Frank did. What didn't he do? What did he forget to do? Those kinds of questions. What he found in his dissertation was that the people, we had the same outcome, same positive outcomes, but people got better faster if they were interviewed. We would ask them, is it okay if I tell Tracy or show him the video of our, of our, con of our consultation here? Oh, sure. So what did Tracy miss? Oh, he was off tonight. Just flat out say it clearly. He was missing some things, and he didn't pay attention to this, and he should have asked me this. And what did Frank miss tonight? Oh, he was really off his game. Very honest responses. So I began using this model myself by switching hats. Sometimes I would just switch chairs in the room, so now I'm the researcher. So long before Miller, Duncan, and Hubble were doing this, I was getting client viewpoints of things that were informed by several dissertations that I led shortly after this time. First one, the first one by Linda Metcalf, some of you know her and her work. She's been a solution focused work for a long time, a leader, and has written about 10 books. And she studied therapists and couples at the Brief Family Therapy Center of Milwaukee. I can't tell you who the therapists were, but you'd recognize every name. And the couples that they did therapy with. The second one was with Jay Haley and Chloe Madonis' Strategic Therapy Center in Rockford, Maryland, and the last one was Harleen Anderson and Harry Galician's place in Houston. Three dissertations on client views of therapy. Very different descriptions than what the therapist and the writers say are, is going on in therapy. The major thing that happened with Linda Metcalf that ended up in a, in a chapter in, a, in the Miller, Duncan, and Hubble's book was that the couple said the major difficulty that we had to deal with and figure out how to get feedback back to the therapist um, we felt kicked out of therapy. We didn't feel as though we were finished. But the therapist told us we were finished. Oftentimes they'd met their goal, the therapist said, well, we're done. And the client said, we weren't done. And even on the Solution Focus listserv recently, we don't have data on whether or not goal setting and goal achievement is equivalent to or even parallel to outcome. We just know they've reached a goal. But whether or not they feel as though they're finished and they're satisfied with it, we don't know. So it's an ongoing question that we probably need to tackle in solution-focused therapy. And I've done a lot with this in the meantime. It's continually trying to get others' perspective on what is the change process in therapy and supervision. So what do we know about BFTC? Were they the gurus? They were pretty good. And the research is carried over from the Mental Research Institute. Same questions that they ask, usually at uh, six 12 and 18 months, but some of the last reviews that they did were just seven to nine months out, and they asked questions like, did your problem recur? If it did, did you go back to counseling? Have you had other problems that led you to go back to counseling? Do you have other problems that you solved on your own? And also simply about what happened back seven or nine months ago? What was your progress like? Was it goal met or some progress toward the goal or no progress or very little progress? And they had 77% say positive, 23% no progress or very little. Well, the, generally across the field, from Lambert and Bergen and others and Wampold, it's about two-thirds. So it was better, but these are the gurus. These are the people who are really, really good at this. And even they weren't able to achieve more than three-fourths. So how can we get better? The thing that most people look at is evidence. I'm sorry, but you can't be ready for discharge. Whoa. 
from your, these notes, your counselor's not using empirically validated treatments, so you can't possibly be feeling better. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. We'll talk a little bit about empirical evidence and practice-based evidence. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration for the federal government in the United States, is kind of the place that people go to try to look at psychotherapy outcomes and whether or not it's evidence-based. Solution-focused therapy is promising. It has not yet made their list. Although we've had some pretty good studies with groups, we've also not done as well as CBT in uh, parent education. So there's some things that we still have to work on to find a way to show that we are evidence-based. Now there are people who say this is an evidence-based approach. They're talking out of their hat or else they're making up their definitions because the federal government has not said that. Maybe your federal government has. I don't know if you have such listings or registries or things, but not ours. So evidence, then evidence-based, the best research evidence, clinical ex expertise, and patient values. And that has a lot of internal validity. It's a, usually a randomized controlled study of some type. But practice-based evidence is where we have to, where the rubber meets the road. This is where we can contribute to the evidence base. It's a range of treatment approaches and supports derived from support of the positive cultural aspects of local society and traditions. This is where you adapt solution-focused, or whatever your model, to the population you serve. And if you don't do that, you're not doing good solution-focused therapy. It has to fit with the people you work with. Now, if you take your think pair share uh, pairs one more time. Um, what have you done to adapt your practice to the population you serve? One small thing that you've done that you've adapted your way of working with the population you serve. If you're not practicing, then imagine it for a moment. If I'm going to work with adolescents, this is what I would do to adjust. I'm going to work with indigenous people or immigrants. This is how I would adjust. Just a couple of minutes. Say, Texas, it's you, y'all, and all y'all. Okay, all y'all done now. All y'all. Okay. If you want to jot down a couple of references to look at SFBT as evidence-based, here are the best ones that we have. We'll have a few more coming out soon. I know Cynthia Franklin and Johnny Kim and others are doing some pretty extensive meta-research, which is, is, is necessary before things... <sighs> There's a pipeline, I won't spend a lot of time going to talk about it in medicine how it works, but there's a pipeline before it gets to the textbooks in medicine, it's sometimes 9 to 15 years. And there's one publication on PubMed every minute. One every minute. So there's so much data, from out, especially outcome data, that takes years and years and years and years to get down the pipeline to the practitioner. And I'll talk about how, what's changing in medicine, because the United States and Time Magazine came out, so we are the worst industrialized nation in terms of medicine. Service delivery, preventative care, we're doing terribly, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But here's some references, I know a couple of you are jotting down a few. If you want to start with something, um, probably Cynthia Franklin is, is the shortest piece that you can find, but the Gingrich and Peterson is a, an article that everyone can get at a family process, and it's a meta-analysis of the research that we've done so far. Naturalistic, the RTC, RCTs, which I was a part of one in medicine with uh, pain control and orthopedic problems. So we've got some good research, it's promising. So what is practice-based evidence? It's pretty much what we talked about in, in 2007. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't work, stop doing it and do something else. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the, is the quote on the right. So this is nothing new. But this is what we do as practitioners, is what works for us, not what's right. Evidence-based practice was never meant to be, let's find the best model. It was never meant to be that. SAMHSA has a wonderful video talking about in medicine you inject people, the bodies are fairly much the same throughout the United States, but even then we have people that are outliers. We have people that do not respond to medications. How much more when it comes to what they call mental or health education or mental health education? We have to adapt. Every segment of the population should be getting a different service delivery based on the best evidence we have filtered through the clinical expertise and the cultural sensitivity of the clinician. That's what practice-based evidence is, and I'm, I'm going to show you some ways. Some are very complicated, some of you new in your careers, I'd love to see you start doing this, and others are fairly simple, three, three simple questions. And here are some of the ways that SAMHSA, like I say, the U.S. federal government says, we need more of this kind of research to flesh out how things work in the mental health field. 
document review, historical analysis, pre and post single, single group studies or single case studies. Uh, and we'll look at analysis of extant uh, epidemiological evidence in just a second with in medicine and ethnographies, as well as just client-informed ways of working. So I'm going to talk a little bit about medicine because I got enthralled just a few years ago with this guy. This is, um, oh, I'll, I'll get to Bruce in a second, sorry. How do we make it relevant? Here's the chart that really frightens me. It takes 17 years to turn 14% of original research to benefit patient care. This has to do with having wonderful research, but it doesn't get funded. Having wonderful research that gets funded doesn't get published. <coughs> then the time for people to do meta-analyses to look across populations so we don't use 19-year-old college sophomores as our norm for understanding how the body works. And then we get to the point where we write it up in textbooks where it gets to the medical school and they find a graduate from medical school and get to their internships and that's when they start practicing medicine. So it takes years and years and little of the evidence that we have that we could possibly benefit from actually gets to the patients in medicine. So here is, oh, the clicker was ahead of me. There it is. There's the gap. What we know and what we deliver. In medicine, that's always been a gap, but it's widening. Because of the rapidity of publications, because so many people are doing wonderful things that nobody knows about, because the, the, the way that the internet has exploded, the people, some people can get to it and others can't. I'll talk about Bruce Ramshaw in a minute. He, his best use of social media and research is Twitter. He finds out about the most up-to-date articles and research through Twitter, rather than going through medical journals. So I want to talk about uh, Bruce because uh, what happened was a friend of mine is a theologian and a lawyer said, I saw this video on YouTube, you've got to see it. This, you and this guy are brothers. You're twins. Watch this 11 minute video, I was just blown away. It's called The Fallacy of the Ideal Mesh. And I'll explain it in just a moment. But he is the Chief of Surgery and uh, the Chair of the Surgery Department University of Tennessee, Tennessee Medical School in Knoxville. He's the first person to do laparoscopic surgery in Russia. He's a world leader. He's uh, been on the board of the America's Hernia Society. Um, I, I stalked him. <laughs> Once I saw this video, I said, I gotta find this guy. I gotta talk to this guy. Found out that he'd published a book the same year with the same publisher, also on, also on systems thinking, which was a part of my supervision book. So when I finally found him through, I don't know, Yelp or something, wrote him an email, said, I'd love to talk to you. Here's a chapter of my book. He said, no, here's where I work. We, we talked for an hour. First time we got on the phone. He invited me down. I did a grand rounds for his medical group. I spent four days watching him do surgery, interviewing clients, doing post-op stuff, and watching this man work and talking about how he is turning medicine on its head. He tried to do the University of Missouri when he was chief of surgery there, and they would not catch on. Knoxville is catching on at their medical school and the surrounding area. And I'll show you a piece of it before we finish talking about Bruce. It's the two of us going into surgery. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> they gave me a stool in case I'd pass out, but I was good. It was, yeah, it was amazing. One woman had a tattoo on her back. It ended up in her front because they had to take out a piece of skin this big. They put it abdominal, abdominal wall reconstruction and then put, pull all the skin back together. She went home one day later. One day. His group alone of three surgeons saved the hospital almost a million dollars that year. Because you don't make money once people get in the hospital, you want to get them out. If they stay longer, you lose money. No pain, leaving, going home in a day. Absolutely amazing stuff that he has found, that he's taken the cutting edge research, circumvented the whole process of waiting for textbooks and getting it to the front. So this, these are the ideas that he talked about in his ideal mesh. Mesh, if you've had an umbilical hernia or an inguinal hernia, it's the stuff, it looks like a screen, and they put it inside your body to hold your stuff in. And then they sew the abdominal wall back over the front of it. I won't show you any pictures. I saw some people with their abdominal wall down around their knees that we were interviewing. They've had 30 surgeries. So he, people flying all over the world for him to fix problems that no one else could fix. Yet there's no ideal mesh. They had over 400 meshes that had gone through randomized control trials. He said, we don't need any more. We got plenty of mesh. We need to find out the right mesh for the right person at the right time, and for that we need continuous quality improvement. We need to look at what works with what variables. It's all non-linear non equations that he works with. It's very, very complex mathematics. But <coughs> what we need is 
a team approach, not a doctor approach. Should have tested this. So going away from traditional research and getting into what he calls continuous quality improvement. And that is you, you, don't even need, you don't need to have an institutional review board because the data is already there. You just study who you've done work with to see where the patterns are that you can then apply to future patients. And we have to think differently about it because we can't wait for the cutting edge research to get to the patients. The patients deserve better is what you talk about. The patient's cycle of care. This is Bruce and he's talking about what he does and give you an idea of how complicated it is, but especially of how long-term his view is. And most of us feel like we're finished with our clients when they leave. And I've never understood that because I've been involved with randomized controlled trials in the past. My dissertation was one. Why aren't we asking people questions six months later? It's actually a better measure of outcome, say some people, including, <coughs> including Lambert, if we don't ask the final questions about outcome the minute they leave therapy. We should wait a little while. But this is Bruce's view of what he's doing. The last 10 years or so, I've dedicated most of all of my uh, practice to hernia disease and related complications. In general, in healthcare, but it also applies to hernia disease, especially for surgical patients, we don't do a very good job of measuring the value of the outcomes that we provide during patient care. We see them post op and make sure they're not having major complications, but then mostly we tell them, you know, go have a good life, and we just believe and expect that they've had a good outcome. But her, for hernia disease, many of the problems develop later, uh, especially recurrent hernias. Uh, but even things like pain can, can begin to be a problem, not just days or weeks, but sometimes months and years after surgery. And so it's important to have a follow-up program that's designed around the patient. So one of the first things I did was begin to develop teams around patients. Uh, the team in the hernia program um, communicates with the patient, and certainly if there's a problem, we want to try to help. Uh, but generally, we also want to learn how they're doing, what their outcomes are, uh, what their experience was, uh, so that we can learn from that. And so it would be uh, over the first few days and weeks initially, and then maybe in a couple of months, but also over time, period of sometimes years, we want to understand how are they doing, what's their quality of life, what's their ability to do their leisure activities, their work, are they having any problems, pain? Uh, certainly, have they had a, a recurrent hernia or have, a, have they had another operation? When they find out that the information that we're going to gain from their care is going to be used to help other people in the future, most people are really excited about that. They really want to do that. The reason we're doing this is so we can all learn together so that we can do better. Um, but you can't do that magically. you got to measure it. And to measure it, we have to have our long-term outcome. So the metaphor that Bruce is invested in, uh, many of you recognize uh, Atul Gawande. You've read the book Being Mortal? Yeah. yeah. He's a part of this movement as well as if we don't have the patient's experience, we don't have good medicine. So the metaphor has changed from a cowboy to a pit crew. The cowboy is this way of thinking. The physician is the center of everything. Everything revolves around the doc, the surgeon. When it's scheduled, whether or not you do the surgery, who's involved, who the nurse reports to, everything revolves around the physician. In an interdisciplinary team approach, the patient and or the disease is the center. It starts there. He even has engineers involved because of the very difficult equations that they have to gather data around and then be able to make sure they have it in discrete categories that they can then look at outcomes in ways that we've never looked at outcomes. One example of this was, the Brandy Foreman is, I can't, can't read these, I'm sorry. This is, uh, someplace in here is the person who schedules and is the patient manager. And they had these very complex formulas. That's one patient who's had 30 surgeries. So it's going to be a very compl complex process from before intake, before they even come in for an interview, to post-op and beyond. And what Brandy found out, she says, you know the people that I have the biggest difficulties with post-op are the people who are most difficult prior to the surgery. They're just a pain in the butt. 
So they started, they started uh, using some measurements for emotional stability. And some people they assigned to cognitive therapy. That was his choice. I've tried to talk about the solution focus. We're working on that. Um, not many people in the Knoxville area that do solution focused therapy. But Brandy was absolutely right. She has no medical degree. She's not a nurse. She's not a nurse practitioner. She's not a doctor. She just noticed what made a difference in people's recovery. So they found that that was more predictive. Emotional difficulties were more predictive than body mass or smoking on the recovery after we began measuring it. So what do we measure? Now, we're not going to go out years in the work that we do, but people want to help each other. I've had clients 18 months in some post-treatment that I've done. They go, so what are you finding out? Is this helping you guys do better? They really want people to do better based on their experience. Uh, I had that experience. Um, I had prostate cancer two years ago. Uh, I didn't tell the story, did I, Alan? Chris was there too. Yeah, you were there. Um, and I had a horrible experience. Great surgeon, best I could get. I ended up with three recurrent UTIs and ended up nearly in the ICU about three months later. Um, fortunately, after four days, I got out, had another scope, found out that when the nurse removed the stitches for the, the external catheter, she tore the stitches. And so there was a, uh, a path from the bladder into the abdominal cavity from the stitches that were in there. So what happened from that? Well, my wife sued him. She's a lawyer. <laughs> no, no we, no, we didn't. No, um, actually, um, we just started talking, and he said, I've never seen this before. I've never heard of it before. I'm going to study up. We're going to solve this, but I'm also going to learn from it. So what happened was they changed their nurse's training on, re on removing the, the uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the catheter. It comes out through your abdominal wall. Um, his surgical technique he changed. Uh, some of the pre-op stuff that they've done has changed. He's written up an article, make me 26th author, that's what I told him. Make, you know, like those medical ones, you know, they just go on forever, make me 26th author. And then he contacted me about three months after this was all done, and he said, uh, could you help me out with something? It depends. So, uh, people in my practice are having arguments about how to break bad news. Kate will re relate to this, Lois will relate to this. How to break bad news. How do we tell people they have cancer? How do we do it? Do it on the phone? Do we call them in? Do you call them in and say, I'll tell you the, tell you the bad news, but I won't tell you anything else because you're not going to hear it? How do we do this? So I began to do some research. Gave him some things to work with to take back to his practice. So we've developed that relationship. Based on my experience, he's learning from it. And other patients are benefiting from it. And, you know, considering where I started, I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm sane part of the time, passing for sane the rest. That's one patient. Mine wouldn't have been quite that complex, but I know when my surgeon went in the second time, he said, we know everything we possibly could know from the research. We've done our consultations. We've looked at all the permutations we can. This is the best we can do. We're learning as we go. You're a test case. So what has resulted from this? Bruce has only been at the University of Tennessee Knoxville Medical School for three years. They now have a partnership in a 700 bed hospital for the surrounding area to do all their hernia surgeries with local anesthetic rather than opioids. Now I'm talking about they're under general anesthesia for the surgery, but they don't get morphine afterwards because they use injections that last up to a week. So it's like getting numbing in your Novocaine that lasts a week. And people are leaving the hospital in a day or two after major surgeries and not needing opioids at all. Their pain doesn't return, doesn't recur, because it doesn't ever happen to that. It's, they're starting to heal already in seven days or longer. And considering that that area where Bruce does work is one of the highest areas of opioid misuse and addiction in the country, and one in 10 report their opioid use and abuse began with surgery, this is a major impact on the culture, being informed by patient outcome. It just happened here about two weeks ago, where they got the grant. So think, pair, share. Two minutes, minute apiece. What's the key point you're taking away from this PBE talk about medicine? Think for a second. What are you taking away just from this little section on medicine? All right, everyone. We'll come back. We'll come back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Now, we're not going to do years of follow-up, but what can we learn from our clients that we can then apply to make ourselves better, make therapy better for future people? That's what practice-based evidence is about for psychotherapy in my mind. Many of you have seen this many, many times. It's terribly misleading. It's a, it's a terrible 
reductionistic view of what we know about change, because this is much more accurate. And the major thing is, you see that big circle up in the top with the little circle in the middle? Uh, what we can account for in terms of treatment effects is that little circle. <laughs> the rest of it we can't even account for. So we know that's something about the client. More about the client than we can even attribute through our research. And what Barry Duncan has done with this, with this model is begin to say, where are the overlaps where we have alliance effects affecting model and technique? If you believe in the model, the model works better. Uh, if you increase your alliance effect, then your therapist effect increases because you build more hope because you're more positive about how this is going to turn out. So there's, this is a much better view of how we can account for change. But the, the major thing is this. If you're only studying solution-focused therapy to become a better solution-focused therapist, you're not going to have a big impact on your outcome. If that's all you're doing, it's not going to have a big impact because it doesn't really matter. More than seven, seven and a half percent is the highest I've ever seen. You should get really, really good at solution-focused therapy, but that won't increase your positive outcomes any more than being really good at solution-focused therapy can take you. You have to do other things. One of them has to do with to become a better person. And this is a direction some people are taking in my, in my other field of, of couple and family therapy is they're looking back at the person of the therapist as the major thing that needs to be focused on throughout the, life, uh, the lifetime of the person practicing. Not on getting continuing education, not on research, developing yourself as a person who's reflective, learns, becoming the kind of person that your clients will uh, attune to. And then also, uh, client expectancy and hope and therapy allegiance. Client believes this can change. We believe we can bring about change in this. We have an alliance about that. It fits for the client. It's the second cab ride. It fits for the client very well. That's, we don't know how high this can go. This is where some of the major changes take place is when we all believe we're going in the same direction, we're going in a good direction, positive things happen for clients. So what do you need to know? What every clinician needs to know from Norcross, Wampold, you recognize these names. Um, I'm leaving out some of the DeClementine Miller stuff from motivational interviewing because that's another important thing that people can learn, but uh, I'll stick with, with this. I hope she has the problem I treat. I hope she treats the problem I have. Uh, you can't match treatment modality with diagnosis. We know that. Someone says, well, does this work with in fact, I think next week I'm talking about it in a class. Does solution focus work with anxiety? Actually, there's some pretty good evidence for internalized anxiety, stress, anger, depression, some things like that. Solution focused has some pretty promising evidence, but you can't match up. Well, I have depression, I need to go get CBT. That's never worked in the research that I've seen. No treatment works for all clients. We have about 400 models. All of them work for some of the people part of the time. And you'll learn, before we get out of here, you better know something besides solution-focused. I think that's a really, really important thing to learn in the program you're in here, in your practice. Some of your clients aren't going to get attuned with solution-focused. They don't believe that's what they want to do. They've been through that. They didn't like it. Then you'd either refer or you find other ways of creating an integrated way of working. What works for one client may not work for another. We talked about that. And this has been around a long time. It's more important to know the sort of patient has the disease and what sort of disease a patient has. We need to know the person not what's wrong. Now, we do know, probably effective, demonstrably effective in the research, that these are the things that matter to make a difference in outcome. This is from Norcross, John Norcross, who has a very large article of review on the SAMHSA side. SAMHSA says, this is our meta-analysis guru for the United States, and he wrote the summary of it. Alliance, empathy, Collaboration, which I think we're really good at doing within Solution Focus, but we can do better by collecting client feedback and then being empathic. Those are the major ingredients of having success. We know those work and they're necessary. I have empathy down there twice, sorry about that. So the two things I'm going to talk about are client preferences and real-time client feedback. This is something we all need in our practice-based evidence practice. Um, like I said, in the late 80s when I started collecting data, I was in a psychiatric outpatient facility and the people we got were kicked out of the inpatient facility because they ran out of money, not because they were better. 
So we were working with a very distressed population of people, many of them disenfranchised. The next place I worked was a disenfranchised population in Dallas for five years. 80% below the poverty line, 75% Hispanic, bilingual, bicultural, not your typical Anglo middle class come in on a <laughs> Tuesdays at two and make your boat payment by having them come in for weeks and weeks and months and months and months. The things that I've seen with matching client preferences and getting real time client feedback have made all the difference in becoming a better therapist, be able to serve people better. So first thing about client, matching client preferences. Some of this you can do on intake. Some of it's simply asking questions you can read and get their information about, just like you would ask about strengths. Or if you're going to ask about uh, medical history or medications or the things that you feel like you need to know about them, is to ask them at the initial contact, what's a good therapist likely to do? What do you expect from a good therapist? It makes a difference for clients to be able to say, these are my preferences. And I want to match up with those as best I can. People have ideas. Have you ever had anybody come in and lay down on your couch? That's why I stopped having a couch. <laughs> they lay down and I said, there's, there's actually two head places here. This isn't a Freudian couch. So they only have one in the Freudian couches, so the, you got to sit up. This looks silly. So, you know. um, no, they oftentimes will come in and say, where do I sit? And then, then they lay down or they don't know exactly, which is your chair? And they have ideas that they've gotten from television and film that you're supposed to talk about feelings. It's the first thing I should ask. How do you feel about that? First thing. But mostly about what's wrong? What else have you had for diagnoses? What's your family history? I had a guy that came in on an emergency basis uh, from Dallas to Fort Worth, and I just happened to have an opening, and it was very clear from the person making the referral that she, she was not giving me somebody who was suicidal. And I said, okay. So I see this guy, and he comes in, and he says, okay, I'm, I'm glad you could see me on an emergency basis. Great. I said, well, uh, t tell me why you're here. Well, I was 6 pounds, 10 ounces. I uh, was breastfed until I was 9 months old, and he went on for about 5 minutes. And I finally said, uh, one second, um, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Could you tell me why you're telling me this? Well, my last therapist needed to know it. Let's assume you didn't have a last therapist. Why are you here? Oh, well, my, my wife has kicked me out of the house and she tried to kill me with a knife. Oh, and I'm losing my eyesight. I'm living out of my car. He had ideas of what he should be doing. So I want to ask what those are so I can say, those don't really match up with me. <laughs> Those don't really fit. If you need somebody that needs to do that, you might need a referral. We need to change the way we work together. Ask the client directly in a strong, confident tone, what are your preferences? And I'll give you a couple of areas that research says matter. Some don't matter as much as others if you ask. But then you accommodate strong preferences. Not just, you know, I'd, I'd rather see a woman. That's not a strong preference. If someone says, I was expecting to see a woman, and, and this is about an event that I had in my life, I don't think I could talk to a man. Let's make a referral. She has very little chance of having a good outcome with me based on strong preference. So, you also ask about what they despise or they fear. I had a client once said, I hate it when you ask questions. <laughs> okay, I'm going to use the imperative form all the time then. <laughs> I don't know how to do this without asking questions and do what I usually do. What do you dislike? What do you fear happening here? It's openly asking people about their preferences, both positive and negative, builds a the, the, uh, better outcome for most people because now it's informed by the client's preferences of what they already know works for them or does not work for them. I was expecting someone that was a little older. Some of you who are fairly young therapists will hear that a bit. Do you, you have children? How long have you been doing this? Have you ever seen anyone with my problem before? I mean, you're going to hear those as, as early career people if you're young. Get ready for it because ask them, is that, your, is that a strong <laughs> preference for you? Do you believe that I would be able to help you? If they say no, then why would you see them? Unless you're the only one that can see you and then you say, well, you're stuck with me. We're going to have to work this out and I'll do the best I can because there's nobody else to see you. But when there's a preference, that's not goal talk. That's different. This is about what shouldn't happen here? I want to give you the best chance of having the best possible outcome. And here are the areas that seem to matter. One is treatment method. Many people are informed consumers. They chose you by going to Psychology Today therapist locator or whatever they use and they see that you work with what they're experiencing as a problem. Or they choose you because of the method that you use. 
they've already read up on you. In fact, they probably know where you live and whether or not you paid your taxes. That's a whole other question of how, how much you want people to know about you. Um, I would frequently scan Google to find out what's out there on you. If you scan me, it's pretty boring. That's, that's a good thing. But clients know a lot about you oftentimes before they come to see you. And some of it has to do with, I like the treatment method that you list. Let's find that out to see if it's a good fit for them. And then, my spouse is a lawyer and she is, sorry I touched the mic. She's a lawyer and she doesn't like going to parties with uh, therapists. They're just too touchy-feely. You know, they're just kind of like, really, how, how was your day? I'm having a glass of wine. I just want to talk. You know, I'm not, not doing therapy with me. Clients have the same preferences. I like going to her, her meetings with lawyers because they like to argue. It's one of the few chances I get to do that. With therapists, they all want to make you feel good. And lawyers, they just want to get after it, you know? So that's fun. <laughs> but some people want something that's a little more cerebral, something's a little more distant. Some want something that's very warm, and they love having empathic responses from people. And just ask them, are we getting too familiar here? Is this something, is this working for you in a relationship? Because I'm not plaid, I'm a chameleon. I'll change. I've got a lot of ways of being with people. But I would need to find out whether or not this fits for you. And then therapist characteristics, they found, in most of the research I've seen, that if they have um, a, a kind of an iffy thing about preference for gender and religion, that's not as important as sexual orientation, race, and marital status. So if they say, you know, I'd rather have a woman, you're probably going to have a pretty good chance of having a good outcome with the person if it's not a really strong preference. Having ma gender matching or, re or religion matching doesn't seem to make a huge difference as much as people say, I really need to have somebody that would understand. I'm black. I need somebody who will understand. All right, a couple more things. Ask directly. Second one, compare to some benchmark. That's where the um, PCOMs will come in that I'll talk about in a minute. There are benchmarks of how people do. What can you expect? Are people getting better at a pace that I could say is normal or average or above average? Well, you need some outside data sometimes to compare to. I'll, I'll get to that myself. I'll, I'll talk that in, in just a minute. Okay. Yeah, partners in change outcome measurement system. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Nadia. No, no. I, I probably won't talk too fast. Um, explicitly address it in session, and then look at alliance forms and feedback and things like that. Um, if you start your career this way, it'll just become part of your practice. There are major um, institutes that use patient outcome measures, and they use iPads. They don't use paper. The client just touches four different lines. We know it's recorded, goes into their database. So there are lots of ways of doing it very quickly that have been developed. You'll improve your treatment outcome. Remember the research we had 40 people that deteriorated and only one was identified by the, by the, uh, the therapist? You'll, you'll identify deteriorations. I've had so many clients say, don't ask me what's better because it's not better this week. Good. I want people to give me that kind of response because I don't want to get to the end of the session and find out I didn't do what they needed done. That's important to get that kind of relationship built with people. And then it's not so important the particular system you use but that you do it consistently. That you do something and collect the information to inform what you're doing with that client and not just with that client but some way to inform your practice. How do you know you're doing good, good therapy? Only if you collect data from clients. Otherwise, you only have part of one side of the story. John Norcross, I love this quote. I heard him speak one time. 80% of the clients are annoyed at you. <laughs> if you don't address those, what he calls ruptures, people tend to deteriorate and drop out. And the easiest way to address those is to give them a very simple feedback. I'll give you three questions in a little bit here. Or to use the Partners in Change Outcome Measurement System. It just comes up in front of you saying, oh, I guess we're not doing as well today as I thought we were. Fairly simple and transparent. It's difficult for therapists because we'd rather believe we're doing great. It's hard to hear some of the things that clients tell us. So now the Partners in Change Outcome Management System. This has been recognized by the federal government as evidence-based since 2010. Scott Miller, Barry Duncan, and other colleagues of theirs. There are two websites right there that you can go to. If you're a solo practitioner, it's free. If there's two or more, you have to begin paying to use the outcome measures. And then you can add your data to worldwide data. There's 23 languages this has been 
uh, transcri or, uh, translated into. I believe Maori's one of them. I believe. Didn't I hear that from somebody here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, it's wonderful to use. I'm a sole practitioner. I've been using it for years. And it's a simply something to put in the file. I supervise someone from the UK who's an, an older uh, social worker. And every case he holds up his, his sheet as to how the client is doing. He just holds it up to the camera and shows me. So it's an easy way to identify what's going well when things were troubled and for me to get a view of the overall case. And it looks like, oh, yeah, there are several different forms. Um, outcome, uh, session, child session, young child session, and supervision. There's several forms that you can use. All of these are free from the website. And this is what the outcome rating scale looks like. This is what you do at the beginning of every session. Okay. It has to be 10 centimeters long. And then you measure it with a ruler. You do. That's how they get the numbers. Just mark on here. It's, been re it's just been remarkably accurate for people. When things get below a certain level, this is time for us to talk. When things get into a mode above, I think it's 25, we're doing okay. Remarkably useful for the therapist to just glance at that and say, oh, there's something we need to address here. The session rating scale is at the end of each session. A little bit different uh, set of questions, but it's still a 10 point scale, 10 centimeters long. I felt heard, understood, and respected. We're back to empathy. I worked on, talked about what I wanted to work on, alliance. Therapist approach is a good fit for me. Once again, back to the alliance of, of what works for the client. And it's a good fit for me, and it was right for me. It was a good outcome. I'm not asking about progress on this. I'm asking whether or not it was a good fit. And you often will address that right at the end and say, okay, there's something we need to work on. There's something I need to work on. I need to adjust. And then you chart it. This is a very simple thing to do. Very simple. If the ORS, you discuss it if the ORS is above 24 and if the SRS is below 35. Very simple. I added a database to mine because I wanted to kind of track some things through time. Just use Excel. I just did a cut and paste with MS Word to do this. I have a client, there's no names on this, they just all have numbers. But then I can check and see how many African American clients have I had and what have been their outcomes. Right? In terms of gender, couples, what's the mean through time? So I can track that to improve me. I need to maybe get some cultural supervision because I'm not doing as well with people of other ethnicities. I need to get some gender cultural supervision from a female because I'm not doing as well with women. This tracks it for me. Rather than saying, I'm a guru, I'm the best. Never believe that. Clients tell me. I was having a conversation with some people at a party one time. My daughter was there, my spouse was there, and somebody asked me, what kind of dad were you? My daughter walked up, interrupted the group, and said, looked at me and said, you have no idea what kind of dad you were unless you ask me. <laughs> She's 20 or so. I said, okay, how'd I do? Pretty good. I ought to give myself an A. She didn't. We haven't talked since. <laughs> Okay, a few more things. This is the simplest one I can give you. This is John Norcross's three questions, about an 80% um, correlation with the SRS from, from his work. And when I, when I went to a workshop of his, he said, I know most of you won't do the PCOMs, you won't do the paper. Can I get you to do this? How are you? How are we? How is this? Three simple questions. How are you? How is this? How are we? Getting at the relationship, checking to see if we missed something major. Is this what we need to be doing? Getting at satisfaction with treatment. Was it helpful? Can I improve? Can I do less or more of something? Very, very simple questions will make a difference in your outcome. More than going to continually going to solution focused brief therapy conferences. Guarantee. Guarantee. Because it will add, it's like binocular vision. It will add a different view. Not that you can't get better at your practice. Not that you shouldn't listen to people helping you get better at your practice of a particular approach. But it's not enough. We've got to find ways to get a client feedback. All right, so think, pair, share, a few minutes. A key idea, 
Practice-based evidence in psychotherapy. What are you going to commit to to practice this week? I don't care if you see clients or don't see clients. There are other ways that you can apply this, and I'm sure some of you are thinking about them already. Think, bear, share. We're nearly finished. Home stretch. Going to finish up. I've been to so many research conferences that all people do put up numbers. Uh, I've never known clients to do real well in terms of numbers. I don't think they're digital. I, I don't think you can capture it. There's so many ways to capture more information rather than reducing them to something that makes more sense to me. Um, somebody said recently, studying the brain to understand the human is like studying ink to understand literature. We are way more complex than Bruce Ramshaw says people are getting more complex. There are more and more things that impact their disease and their recovery. And I'll close with this story about Bruce. There's a woman that came in, an African-American woman, about 75, had at least six or seven surgeries on her hernias. Bright, she was a ray of sunshine. It was just great to listen to her, to listen to her speak. And I'm sitting in there, and Bruce is talking, and he's getting ready for the surgery. He says, so who will be taking care of you, which is a major part of what he does. You cannot leave there on your own. Most of them are neighbors. And, and friends, not family. It's very interesting how he develops a network of people to take care of folks after this major, major surgery. And she said, oh, I was going to depend on my husband, but he died last week, so I'm just going forward with it. And Bruce turned to me and said, well, Dr. Thomas, would you like to talk with her? <laughs> and it was great, because I knew he was going to say no. He was going to delay the surgery. So he was thinking, okay, where in my schedule might I be able to do this, and how am I going to work with this woman who drove all this way from out of town and I didn't have to tell her no? And he's kind of struggling with the hard stuff that doctors don't like to do. I've had a lot of doctors tell me, hey, you need to go and tell somebody that their, their person is dead, their daughter, their spouse. I'm going, I'll go with you. I'm not going to do it. This is part of what you have to do. So we had a nice conversation. And then Bruce had to tell her that she wasn't going to do the surgery. Very disappointed. But it's important for us to listen to the people's contexts, to give them the best possible chance. So, in summary, what do you do? Practice. This is Bruce Lee. I was a martial artist for 15 years. I taught for seven. Um, nothing like Bruce Lee. He's, he's a legend. But if you're good, find somebody better and practice. If you've slept, get up and practice. If you've kind of mastered everything, if you know anything about martial arts, you know there are about, there are about six ranks in most arts before you get to black belt. There are more ranks above first black than below. Why? Because you're a beginner when you get to black. That's a major, major mindset of people in martial arts of, I've just now gotten a grasp of this, now I can get good. Rather than, remember the Dunning-Kruger curve? <laughs> I'm really good, I'm a white belt, got my yellow. No, no, you're going to hurt somebody. That's all that's going to happen here. And then, <laughs> we don't spend enough time listening. We don't spend enough time listening. We don't ask questions. How are we? How is this going? What do you fear? What has to happen here for this to be successful? That's the second taxi ride. That's all it is. It's empathetic listening. It doesn't take much more time. My average over 30 years, 30 years, was 5.5 sessions. And I didn't take on easy cases. I just really wanted to do good brief therapy, and it goes faster when you're in together, when you have an alliance, and everybody agrees this is good, we move forward together. Finally, Ben Caldwell. He's written a book called Saving Psychotherapy. It's a great book, and he's, he thinks we're going to be obsolete if we don't change. And a lot of it is based on outcome. He said, you should be publishing your outcome numbers on your website. The average is 66% across the research. I do 75%. Here's what I do well with. Here's what I'm working on. He said, you should be putting up for people to see so informed consumers can know. Because there's little accountability for us. And the future is evidence of effectiveness. Not how well you can talk about it, not how much money you make. So Ben Caldwell, let's go to Ben, type in Ben Caldwell, Saving Psychotherapy, and you'll come up with that book. Whoops. It's not going to go. I want to end <laughs> once again with a horned frog, and thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Every week I've been here, it's been better. Thanks for having me very much. Thank you. Thank you.